Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Tower has documented his work in these publications which you can refer for further understanding. The another set of experiments done by Haslop Harrison was to prove that the environment influences germ cells through somatic cells as well. For his experiment he used the moth called Selenia bilunari. What he did was he fed these moth on a manganese coated food. What he found is the moth became melanic that means pigmentation was there on the moth. So which means the somatic cells got modified, somatic cells got altered, they acquired a character. From these moth the offspring which came they were also melanic. So that means there was a permanent change in the genotype as well as the phenotype. So the environment influenced both genotype and phenotype of the offsprings through somatic cells which in other words the influence of environment on germ cells through somatic cells. Neolamarchist also argued that the formation of germ cells also takes place from the somatic cells as in the case of asexual reproduction or the vegetative propagation. And the example cited is the plants which develop from the leaf buds, tubers or stem cuttings through asexual reproduction. Having these idea about Lamarckism and Neolamarckism. Now let us move to the next prominent theory of evolution given by Charles Darwin and termed as Darwinism and further the Neo-Darwinian view of that. Charles Darwin who gave the Darwinism and yet another theory, similar theory by Alfred Russell Wallace. Darwin developed the theory of evolution based on the mechanism of natural selection. Surprisingly, Alfred Russell Wallace also developed essentially the same theory but independently around the same time. And these two, two theories were communicated to Linnean Society of London in 1858. Though both of them belong to different social, economic and educational backgrounds, the, their voyages, their journeys or excursions of discovery played an important role in their studies. Charles Darwin went to a voyage which we call as voyage of his discovery on a ship which is called as HMS Beagle. HMS refers to his or her majesty ship. Here is the picture of the ship at the southern tip of South America which is being taken. This voyage lasted for five years from 1831 to 1836. Here you can see the route of the voyage. It started from England Plymouth in 1831 and ended back in the England itself in 1836 at Falmouth. Out of these five years, one particular month they spent on this area which is called as Galapagos Island, which is very prominent in the theory of evolution by natural selection as given by Darwin. If you focus on Galapagos Island map, there are a number of islands which constitute the whole Galapagos Island here. 
Russell Wallace also went to a voyage of discovery. He was very much influenced by Charles Darwin. So along with a friend and a naturalist, Henry Walter Bates, he went to Brazil in 1848. The purpose of the trip was he wanted to collect insects so that he can come back to England and sell these insect collections to the museum curators and the collectors in the England. But unfortunately, when they were returning back to England, there was a fire in the ship and they lost all the collections that they had during this period of their voyage along with their notes, diaries and everything. But Wallace again went to another voyage to it, the now called Indonesia and Malaysia from 1854 to 62 for the eight years. Wallace is well known for his enormous contribution in the field of biogeography. He identified a biogeographical barrier which is now popular, popularly known as Wallace Line. The name Wallace Line was given by Huxley though Wallace identified this line. This Wallace Line separates species with links to Australian from the species that links to East Asian connections. Here if you can see this is the Wallace line which separates the Asian or Oriental with the Australia. As you can see there are Wallace line by Huxley. There was another Wallace line the redefined one by the Meyer. There is another line which is called as Weber line and so on. And the in between area is called as Wallachia which has unique fauna. This is just to give you a brief idea about the contribution which Wallace had during his voyage. Coming back to Darwin, what he observed on his voyage of five years, there was an exotic collection of plants and animals on the islands during the voyage which he could observe. He also noted that on the mainland, just like that, different islands with similar environmental habitats were not always occupied by the same species. Also, the distribution and relationship between living and extinct forms. Based on these observations and the fauna which he could observe, there were some questions in his mind. Like, what could account for the distribution of organisms? Did separate and different creations make one species in one place slightly different from another species in another place? Why is it so? And more importantly, how it is being achieved? Darwin was very much influenced by two people. One of them is Charles Lyell who proposed principles of geology according to which earth is not a very new in terms of age. It is a very old structure and which undergoes continuous change. Another person Thomas R. Malthus who gave the principles of populations according to which the population increase in a geometric uh, progression whereas resources to increase only in arithmetic progression. Geometric means 2 leading to 4 leading to 8 leading to 16 and so on. Whereas the arithmetic progression is 1 leading to 2 leading to 3 to 4 and so on. Darwin published his book The Origin of Species which is the main book where he has talked about origin of new species by natural selection and there are a number of volumes. The first one published on November 24, 1859. Again, just like Lamarck's theory, if we try to put Darwin's theory in a nutshell, it says the excess reproduction and the limited resources lead to competition which because of natural variations and natural selection 
allows those best adapted to pass their characters to the next generation. Which means there is always an excess reproduction. So number is very high. Again, the geometric progression as Malthus pointed out. And there are limited resources which increase only in arithmetic progression. Because of which there is a competition between the number of the individuals. And ultimately because of natural variations and the natural selection in operation, only those which are adapted to pass their characters to next generation. These are the basic postulates of this theory. There is an overproduction as we just discussed leading to struggle for existence. This struggle can be between the members of the same species with the other member of other species or with the environment ex uh, itself leading to variation and heredity and then nature selects something which we very commonly call as survival of the fittest leading to evolution or origin of new species. Now the same basic postulates we can put in this flowchart form. Every individual has a reproductive ability to progress in a geometric progression way. For example, if it is a paramecium or let's say E. coli which divides in 20 minutes itself. So you can imagine how fast it propagates its population. So there is a reproductive fecundity associated with it. But the environmental restrictions are there. There are limited resources. Because of these environmental restrictions, this reproductive fecundity is kept in control. Since the resources are limited and the number is more, there is always a competition, a struggle for existence. As we just discussed, this struggle or competition can be between the members of the same species. It can be between the members of one species with the another one or it can be a competition with the environment. There are heritable variations, the difference in genetic traits between the organisms already existing. So when this competition occurs, some of them might be best suitable according to that particular environment. So that means nature selects that fittest individual which undergoes various adaptation or environmental changes leading to evolution. So this is the flow chart which describes the whole theory of Darwin of origin of new species by natural selection. Remember the term survival of fittest was given by Herbert Spencer. It was used by Charles Darwin after a long time. Now the same example of giraffe which we discussed in case of Lamarck, let us discuss the same story in Darwinian way. According to Darwinian view, the giraffe when reproduced, it had a variety of individuals. Some individuals born happened to have longer necks. So there was already a variation existing. When they grew adult, the ones which were having the long neck, they could survive because they could reach the higher length of the tree to get the food in terms of leaves. Rest all which were unable to reach that height, they died. So this particular one got the advantage, got selected by nature. So this is termed as the fittest one out of all these varied forms. And when they reproduced, again reproduced, again reproduced, that means generation after generation, these changes kept on accumulating and the new species evolved. So unlike Lamarck, here in Darwinian view, the variations was existing already and nature selects the one which is best suited for this particular environment and then it leads to origin of species. 
as we said Wallace also did the similar work and proposed similar theory just like Darwin but independently. So this is represented in the form of Wallace chart but very similar views. There is a rapid multiplication but the resources are limited hence the population is kept stable. The inference from these three comes that there must be some struggle for existence. And since there is struggle for existence, due to existing variations and heredity, the one which is the fittest will survive and thus the natural selection will operate. Because of the survival of the fittest, due to adaptations, there will be origin of new species. So, Wallace chart is similar to what we discussed in case of Darwin. But remember, this was an independent theory. There are a number of evidences in support of Darwinism. The first is the artificial selection. Artificial selection is something that man does in a controlled breeding environment with the domesticated species. For example, if we want to have the high yielding milk yielding cows, we select the parents which do have high yielding varieties, which do have better strength. Same is the case with the poultry. Let's say if we want to have the hens which can give more number of eggs, we will select the parents with the variety which can produce more number of eggs and we will breed them so that the progeny acquires that character. This is called artificial selection. The way artificially we select, nature also selects the one which are having the better traits. So this theory supports the natural selection. Yet another evidence in support is from the coevolution. For example, the position of nectaries in plants. Let's say if it, this evolves, the insects which pollinate on them, their length, proboscis length also evolves accordingly. So there is a coevolution. If they do not evolve according to this, they will not be able to survive. So the coevolution is also supporting the natural selection. Yet another example comes from the mimicry or protective coloration, which is the gradual changes in the model and mimic occupying the same area. If model is changing, if evolving, the mimic also has to change or evolve in order to survive. There are experimental evidence also in case of natural selection. For example, WFR Weldon carried out experiments with a shore crab called as C. moinos. What he did is, he placed the crabs at a place where the flow of Plymouth Sound River was slow because of which there was a deposition of clay and the crabs started dying because of that clay deposition. Only the ones with narrow frontum survived and reproduced. So, he experimentally proved that the natural selection is operating in nature. There were already some crabs with the narrow frontum. Because of this condition, the ones having narrow frontum, they got selected because they were fit according to that particular situation to survive. And then they reproduced and gave rise to newer species, hence leading to natural selection operation. Another very famous example in support of natural selection is the industrial melanism in the case of peppered moth called as distant batularia and carbonaria. This experiment was carried out by Bernard Kettlewell. These are the pictures of the moth. This is the non-melanic form and this is the melanic form. These are the two contrasting forms that it can occur in. Now, what they did is, during industrialization in Britain, he selected two areas. 
One is the Dorset, which was an unpolluted area. That means there was no industrial revolution. There was no deposition of soot on the tree. Another area was Birmingham, which was polluted because it was industrially revolutionized. What he did is, they released 496 non-melanic form and 473 melanic form in this unpolluted area. They released after tagging them. And then, after some time, they recaptured those tagged moths. What they found is, in the unpolluted area, they found or they could recapture non-melanic form more as compared to the melanic form. The reason being, the melanic form in unpolluted area was easily detected by the predators and thus predators ate melanic forms more as compared to the non-melanic forms. And because of which, when they recaptured, they could get more of non-melanic form because there was already less number of melanic forms because they have been eaten up by the predators. Similar is the case with the polluted area of Birmingham. Here they could find melanic form more on recapturing as compared to the non-melanic form. Reason being, in the polluted area, since the tree was dark because of deposition of soot, the non-melanic form could not hide itself and the predator could eat more of non-melanic form. So, on recapturing, they could recapture more of melanic form as compared to the non-melanic form. So, this is a clear-cut example of natural selection. But just like Lamarckism, the natural selection theory by Darwin also underwent a number of criticism. The first criticism is, it talked about survival of fittest. But Darwin could not explain how this fittest individual arrived in the population. So, survival of fittest is fine, but what about the arrival of fittest? Then, non-dilution of inherited characters upon breeding with the worms that do not have them. So, if an individual has a desired trait or inherited trait, if it is bred with another individual which does not have that, why there is no dilution of these characters in the further progenies or offsprings? Darwin could not explain this. He could also not explain about the existence of vestigial organs or the use and disuse which Lamarck proposed. Darwin supported natural selection by artificial selection. But when we do artificial selection, there is no permanent variation in the offsprings. They do not pass on generation after generation. So why this lack of permanent variation is there because of artificial selection that he could not explain. He could also not explain how the terrestrial form evolved from the aquatic form by his theory of natural selection. So the number of criticism points are there. These are just a few to emphasize upon. Darwin gave a number of supplementary theories. For example, the theory of sexual selection. In this theory, he said the sexually dimorphic species where the male and female do exist, which are phenotypically different, the choice of mate selection lies mostly with the females. And the reason being, females are the ones who invest more in the development of progeny or their further future species. Hence, in order to get selected by the females, the males do possess attractive features and they do compete with each other in order to get selected by the female. For example, they can be a beautification as in the case of peacock. If you compare a peacock with a peahen, Peacocks are with brilliant feathers. So all male peacocks, they do compete with each other in terms of their brilliance of feathers so that females select the one with the most beautiful feathers. 
Same is the case with male deer. They do have antlers. So female may select the one which is having the best antlers. Male frogs are being selected based on their vocal sex. The seahorse may be selected on the basis of the brood pouch they carry. Now this sexual selection is different from what we saw in case of natural selection. Sexual selection depends on the success of some individuals over the others of the same sex. Let's say if males are competing, so some of the male will get success over rest of the male members of the same sex in order to get selected by the female. Whereas in case of natural selection, success depends on survival of both the sexes, not just reproductive capability or selection of one sex. Also, sexual selection is associated mainly with the reproduction, but natural selection is associated with the survival primarily. Yet another theory as we just discussed is the theory of artificial selection as given by the Darwin. The man-made selection to breed the individuals with the desired traits so that these traits can be propagated in future generation is called as artificial selection. So as we just discussed, if you want to have high egg yielding traits in poultry, you will select the parents accordingly. If you want to have high milk yielding cows, you will select the parent accordingly. Same is the case with high yielding crops etc. Remember, Darwin used the case of artificial selection as a supporting evidence to prove his theory of natural selection. He said, the way we select artificially in order to improve the future generations, nature also select the fittest one to improve the futuristic species. Another supplementary theory which Darwin proposed was theory of Pangenesis. Remember, we are just discussing this theory because it has some historical importance as it was proposed by Darwin, but it is totally discarded now based on the present day knowledge. It was proposed by Darwin to explain the inheritance of characters. All somatic cells of the body produce minute particles termed as pangenes or gemmules. According to Darwin, these pangenes or gemmules are transported by blood to the germ cells. So all somatic cells produce pangenes by blood they reach to the germ cells. Hence germ cells are miniature replica of the whole individual. And when they get fused or fertilized they start making a new individual according to the replica that they are carrying. So, what we discussed about the criticism of Darwinism, it led to something which we call as Neo-Darwinism now. It started with the discovery of mutation as proposed by Hugo de Vries in Mutation Theory and the development of genetics as proposed by Mendel. It leads to the notion that large evolution takes place by jumps or saltations or mutations rather than the, by the gradual changes which Darwin proposed. Neo-Darwinism is nothing but a reconciliation of Mendelism or the Mendelian views of genetics, the population genetics along with the Darwinism. The population genetics view of Darwinism or Neo-Darwinism is a theory that emphasizes the frequency of genes in populations as the basis of evolutionary change. It is not the individual which Darwin said the survival of fittest. Remember that? Here this view says it is the frequency of genes in population that is the basis of evolutionary change. The population genetics was given by G. H. Hardy and W. Greenberg. We will discuss them. Well, we will take the session on population genetics. 
by 1930s it became accepted with the advancements in the field of genetics that evolution is a phenomena at population level not at the individual or species level and it can be represented by changes in the gene or allele frequencies due to various natural forces has it been mutation selection genetic drift etc these changes may lead to differences among populations or species at a larger scale now besides this neo darwinism there is something called modern synthesis of evolution or synthetic theory or evolutionary synthesis so by 1940 1940s along with the mendelian genetics and the population genetics systematics and paleontology were also added to this view and this now wholesome is called as modern synthesis of evolution so in simple words it is a reconciliation of darwin's theory with the modern genetics that include both mendelism as well as population genetics which gave rise to a theory that emphasized the coaction of mutation selection genetic drift gene flow and so on so it is a combined recent theory of evolution according to this theory the evolution is a hierarchical process that operates at three different levels it can be a genetic level which leads to changes in genetic composition of individuals or it can be organismic level where it operates in terms of individual variations and differential survival through adaptation and evolution of new structures behavior functions etc the yet another level can be a population level where the changes in gene flow between populations and subsequent origin radiation and adaptation of species are being considered the population genetics view in terms of gene frequencies genotypic frequencies come under the population level now let us quickly discuss what do we mean by darwinism and neo darwinism in contrasting ways according to darwinism it is the individual or species that is the considered as unit of evolution whereas neo darwinian view says it is the population which should be considered as unit of evolution it is a gene pool that evolves not the individuals as pointed out by darwinism the mortality or survival of individuals is not responsible for evolution as pointed out by darwin in terms of survival of fittest etc but it is the differential reproduction of genotypes that matters variation is the raw material for evolution and this variation can arise because of mutation because of recombination crossing over etc besides struggle for existence chance phenomena the genetic drift phenomena also plays a role in evolution that is a neo darwinian view now once we have discussed the lamarckism neo lamarckism darwinism and neo darwinism let us quickly discuss the theories or the points which people have given even before darwin or wallace about natural selection and one of them is william charles wells who discussed the changes in skin color in response to natural selection the darwin also stated that wells distinctly recognized the principle of natural selection and this is the first recognition which has been indicated but the drawback was that he applied it to only humans and to only a few characters but nevertheless he did mention the theory of natural selection well before the darwin and wallace another their example is patrick matthew <coughs> since he was involved with timber and timber development he said that culling inferior trees would improve the quantity quality of timber produced in future generations and might even result in new varieties he also pointed out 
that progeny of same parents under great differences of circumstances might in several generation even become distinct species incapable of co-reproduction. <coughs> in simple words, it means that if the same parents give different progenies which you keep under different circumstances, after several generations they will be so different that they will be incapable of reproduction. That means they will become distinct species. Darwin stated that Matthew clearly saw the full force of principle of natural selection. Two another people which need to be highlighted when we are discussing the natural selection before Darwin and Wallace are one of them is William Lawrence who said the occasional production of an offspring with different characters from those of the parents as a native or congenital variety and the propagation of such varieties by generation. Though he didn't use the word natural selection per se, but he explored the variation and selection, which are the key points in natural selection theory. And the second one was Edward Blith. Blith worked on Indian fauna. Again, he also didn't use the word natural selection, but he believed that selection maintains the species and eliminates the variants. Darwin acknowledged the great value of Blitz's knowledge in the first chapter of his book, The Origin of Species. Again, Blitz, just like Matthew, explored the variations and selections. Let us quickly summarize what we did today. We started our lecture with discussing Lamarck and Lamarckism. We discussed the theory given by Lamarck in the form of inheritance of acquired characters. We discussed various supporting evidence and the criticism of Lamarck's theory. Then we moved on to Neo-Lamarckism and the experimental proofs to support the Neo-Lamarckism. Then we discussed about Charles Darwin, his theory Darwinism and the Alfred Russell Wallace similar thoughts on it. We discussed the voyages of discoveries of both these people. Then the theory of origin of species by natural selection as given by Darwin, various supporting evidence and criticism of Darwinism. We also discussed the supplementary theory in the form of sexual selection, artificial selection and penogenesis. Then we moved to discuss neo-Darwinism and the modern synthetic theory. And lastly we discussed various other views by different people about evolution by natural selection well before the Darwin and Wallace. For your further readings, I would like you to suggest to go through these books by Ridley, by Hall and Falgrimson and Douglas Fatuyama. Thank you so much. Happy learning.